Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Annette Miller. Um, my business is Equity by Design. A lot of the work that I do is about making sure that diverse people's voices are in the center of decision making. So we really tried to work on policy and br bridging and cross-cultural facilitation um, to make that important voice work happen. Um, we are Madison-based um, in terms of where we do our work, um, but we, we like to do the work where the people are is, is the bottom line. Um, I'm really honored to be here today to be co-facilitating. Um, I think that what's happening in this moment, we've seen this happen before, where we've had tragedy happen in our black and brown communities. And there's a lot of anger and pain around the need for change, um, that enough is enough. Um, and what we really want to be a part of is really ensuring that it's this moment, it's this time, that we stop it, that we stop using black and brown bodies um, and that we have um, the ability to turn the corner and really start together collectively making change. And so the purpose of today is to really talk about how can we make change? How do we learn about it? Think about it, how do we do it? And I say this because I know that there are many people um, in a movement, um, there is there's uh, different people are expressing and feeling different things, but I wanna be mindful of the fact that people died, have died and continue to die um, over the lack of um, equity in our society, that there is racism, that there is anti-black sentiment in our country and in our communities and no one is exempt from it. And so, as we think about this moment um, and as we march and as we yell and scream um, and as we discourse and talk that this is about making this be sustainable, that we all have a role in making sure that this changes and that we understand that we cannot do this work alone. And so I wanna center us around that understanding that this is not uh, a moment for people like myself and others. Uh, this is personal, it's real, um, and it's created a lot of trauma. And so we really wanna make sure that we really think hard and long about how we can be part of the solutions, how we can sustain, sustain the solutions. And so I wanna bring um, on board my colleague, Eric Upchurch. Um, he is very good at really thinking about um, mindfulness and, um, strategies around mindfulness that help us think about how we center ourselves and how we focus ourselves. And so I want to bring him into the space so that we can all take a moment to acknowledge and understand what is at hand, not only today, but tomorrow and in the future. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Eric. Thank you for that, Annette. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful. So I'm going to invite us to um, remember, uh, it's going to be brief, uh, but just to kick things off, I want to invite us into the remembrance of something that's always with us, that never leaves us, that always kind of calms us and sustains us, um, and that is our natural breath. It's not the labored breath, the intentional breath, but just how you are naturally breathed by this uh, deeper wisdom that is how are our body functions. And for those who can, if you will, uh, sit with your back comfortably straight, I invite you to close your eyes or take a low gaze and allow a few natural breaths to enter your awareness. Allow yourself to become aware of how your body is breathing for you. You may notice how the air coming in is cooler on the way in and warmer on the way out. And this is a kind of harmony. This is a kind of care that we can rest in. There are so many living things, living cells that are cooperating now to allow us to breathe, to allow us to have our sustenance, sustenance that we don't have to reach for, that we don't have to worry about. The breath is coming in to go out, to come back in. 
And here we are gathered together digitally and across distances also as living things that are working together so that we as a community can live and can thrive. With that, I invite you to take a couple more natural breaths, have that gratitude, and let's get ready to get started. Perfect, thank you so much, Eric. And we're gonna to get to hear a little bit more from Eric today about some tips that he has for us for taking care of ourselves and others in this journey. Um, and once again, I just wanna share a couple of framing thoughts from the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies about where we're going today. So as a center that looks at civil society, community efforts and nonprofit organizations, we know that social movements for change rely on a variety of actors and change agents those that show up in a big way and those that do what they can in their daily lives. And so a big premise of this conversation is that anyone that can participate with us here can have a role in our collective efforts towards anti-racism and towards a more just society. And the wonderful people that you're gonna hear from today all take on different roles in their own activism and their ways of having an influence. And we're really excited about how we hope that the variety of their efforts can inspire all of us to do better in our own lives. And even from the first session, we had some exciting um, feedback. We had a, you know just a few examples, but we had um, someone from Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, which is a very small town, um, say that they were getting a neighborhood group together to hold themselves accountable for anti-racist activities. Um, we've had some things going around in our network about people in smaller Wisconsin communities um, working on some statues that really need to be addressed in those communities so that people can feel like they're being honored in their own communities in those places. And there are just simple examples like that all over where people are making the moves that they can in their own, in their own communities. Um, the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies um, has a tagline that says, inquiry and action for social change. And I think that's important to emphasize here because we don't really claim to have the answers for anybody or for you, um, but what we can do is ask questions and bring people together and invite everyone to the table on social change. So that's really what we're gonna try to do today. And we're gonna go through these themes that we've identified as important for all of our individual actions. And Annette's gonna share just a little bit more about that. Um, but I wanna just um, emphasize that we really wanna make sure that this leads to action and sustainable action. And so we are gonna each make an individual action plan today, or at least start one as a part of this session. And then also um, our center along with Equity by Design and the Mortgage Center for Public Service and anyone else that would like to come to the table, we're gonna try to figure out ways to support you in your sustaining action. And um, one other important note here is we do think we have a national audience here today. And so um, we, with COVID-19 ironically making us all more comfortable with virtual activity, there's really no reason why we can't invite everyone to this table uh, wherever you are. So Annette, do you wanna share a little bit about the themes and the prog progression through our time together? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So first and foremost, just understanding that we're all coming into this space experiencing this moment in different ways, it is not the same. And so that's why it's really important to have this cross-cultural group um, coming together to speak about what we are each experiencing and what we're collectively experiencing. And I think this is um, really um, just, I, I guess I'm speechless in a way because um, it, it's hard to bring different mindsets to the table. And I'm just really proud of the fact that we were able to do this in this space. And so because we have um, different people in this space, it is going to be unsatisfying in terms of what you will be able to learn in this moment. So there will not be enough time to know everything that we need to know. And that's why that resource document is really important. Um, and also just a reminder that this is the first step of hopefully many more steps. And so what we're going to walk through today is a couple of themes. One is learning. So what do we need to know that we don't know? And how can we learn more about what it is we need to to understand about ourselves, about what's happening, um, and how, how we can build um, together the work. 
how do we take care of ourselves, right? Like, so there's so much going on. How do we, how do we understand what it is we need to do to take care of ourselves? Because if we're going to sustain this movement. We have to make sure that we put the mask on ourselves so that we are then able to sustain um, this moment, but also know how to understand that there are other people walking side by side with us that we also can rely on and lean on, that it doesn't all have to come through us and come out through us. So how do we lean on others uh, to do the work as well? So that is a part of taking care of ourselves and others. And then also, how do we exert influence um, in our spheres of where we live, where we work, um, and where we uh, play, quite frankly. So how, what does that look like? How we, can we use our power, our individual power and our collective power? And what does that look like? And then what does support look like? How do we support others who are doing the work? Um, how do we make sure that there is enough to be able to do the change that is required um, to make this be sustainable? And then act, how do we act? We don't need talking, we've talked about this enough. What do we need to do and what does that look like? Not only on an individual basis, but on a collective basis. And um, what, you know, what can we all learn and understand about what those actions look like and what is our commitment, right? Action comes from commitment, it comes from doing. And then what does sustaining look like? What does it look like? It'll be great to have some people talk about how they've been able to sustain the work. And then what do we need to know in terms of resources and making connections to be able to sustain that work as well. So we'll be moving quickly through these themes um, to give you a flavor and a taste. Um, but again, with the expectation that we will bridge into other opportunities where we can spend more time doing that. So with that, I will turn it back over to Mary Beth to um, get us kicked off. Yep, and just a reminder that um, you'll want to keep an eye on the chat in Facebook Live um, for some opportunities where we're going to have you give feedback there and then also um, to see the links to some of the documents that we're going to be referring to. Um, so we're going to start today to really um, kind of do something that I find really exciting, which is hear from what's happening out there in the field right now in a few different communities where our center is connected. I've enjoyed very much um, staying connected with some of our graduate students in Atlanta, um, friends on the coasts, um, folks in Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, smaller towns in Wisconsin, just hearing about you know, what this looks like in each of those individual communities. So that's what we're gonna start with today. Um, I know here in Wisconsin, um, I mentioned in the last call, you know, our largest city in Milwaukee has a variety of different actions happening, multiple ones on a daily basis. We even had one led by the Milwaukee Bucks basketball team, um, all the way down to smaller subsets of parts of the community that want to advocate for something really specific within the movement. Um, and a lot of our small towns that I've, I've been really impressed um, and was, was um, surprised in some cases um, have had some great protests in my hometown of La Crosse, Wisconsin, just had a bunch of young advocates of color that led a march there yesterday. And I was really proud to see that. Um, I'm gonna turn to Tara, who's gonna share with us a little bit about Madison um, and then maybe a little bit about Minneapolis. And then we'll go through with Lisa from Minneapolis We'll touch on Chicago, and then we'll have Felicia from Ferguson, Missouri, and Stephen from Camden, New Jersey share. So with that, we'll go um, in that order, if you please. Cool, can you hear me? Okay, awesome. So like Mary Beth said, hi, I'm Tara. I'm a, a part of the community and nonprofit leadership major here at the University of Wisconsin. But aside from that, I've been doing a lot of activism both here and virtually as remotely as possible to the Twin Cities, which is where I'm from. Um, and so just to kind of think about some of the things that I've seen from this movement, um, I kind of touched on a couple of these in the last one, but I'll expand so that it's not the exact same. Um, but some things that I've really appreciated is like seeing a movement that's really being yet led by young people with the support and mentorship of those who are a little bit more like veteran to activism. Um, I'm not old, but I'm getting older. So by the third night of like being out there, I was absolutely exhausted. Um, but I'm still young enough to have people look at me and, you know, in a lot of spaces, especially professional, like doubt your ability to lead and really like take charge and understand what's going on. Um, and not once in one of these spaces has anyone ever looked at me and been like, you don't know what you're talking about. It's been a lot of like 
collaborative efforts to be like, you know this about this and I know this about this rather than someone being like, oh, well, I know everything. And that's been really wonderful to see. Um, other than that, just like finding the different ways that people are able to support the movement. So there's been a lot of push to like donate to bail funds and local nonprofits, um, especially in the Twin Cities when it all started. And so through that, I was able to get connected with a couple that I've been working with remotely to do things like coordinating supplies, um, just communicating, helping do some ground or communicate between ground people and really just try to organize everybody. And so that's been something that's been unique in my perspective of things that I've seen. Fantastic, thanks for that, Tara. Um, Lisa, would you share a little bit about your observations from Minneapolis? Hi, uh, bonjour everybody. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, here in Minneapolis, I just had to run, make a run to the phone store because my phone has been acting up suspiciously lately. And, you know, just the, the continuing uh, effort at putting the city back together again, you know, that what from the damage and then from different, like the boarding up of businesses and protection and all the artwork. I drove by one building and it it still had um, writing on it or it had, they had painted on there, it said mom and then I can't breathe. And I just kind of like lost it at that point. You know, the impact is, is just, it's still fresh here. It's still raw, it's still open. And, um, you know, but that on the other end of it, we're still working towards and looking towards solutions and how do we, how do we even begin to begin the healing? You know, like, how do you begin to begin to begin the healing? So this afternoon, you know, meeting, we have a meeting set up with the city council. They have their ideas. The community has their responses. You know, we're, again, you know, listening to the comments from Camden in the last session, you know, how they, they press the notion you have to stay engaged you have to keep pushing don't close your eyes for a second because things the old old guard and old status quo just pops right back into place you know like those little bouncy things that you push them down it pops back up again and that's what we're up against here and you know it's it is a it's a not just a black and white issue it is a four directions issue you know it's a global issue as well so the work that we do um, and, and it's not just beginning. This work is a continuing effort. It's ongoing. You know, it it's a result of you know we we need to work harder. So I look forward to the conversation and hearing people share their stories and you know listening to ideas on how to you know keep the action, keep the momentum, and you know let's work harder. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And Lisa, we'll hear from again later in the call. But just um, I'm going to invite everybody to give a little context about um, where they're coming from. And Lisa, I think um, I would say that you're an Ojibwe teacher and activist who's been involved with um, allyship and collaboration across the indigenous groups of the Twin Cities with Black activists there. Is that a fair um, bio for you for this purpose? OK, all right. Great. So my friend Alyssa from Chicago, I don't think she's on the call. Are you here, Alyssa? Okay. Well, I will just share then from Chicago perspective that one of the things that happened um, this weekend was that the pride activities of um, the of Chicago, which have always had a huge following and are really robust for the whole month of June, they've started pretty much completely converting those into um, Pride for Black Lives activities, which I thought was really cool and intersectional. And um, they completely shut down Halstead Street on Sunday with blocks and blocks of people kneeling um, while speakers spoke from Black lives, trans lives, um, advocacy perspectives. So that's just one little taste. I know I've been keeping up with Alyssa and what she's been doing, and I've seen her at events focused on kids and families and how they can do actions. Um, and there's just a variety of things, of course, like all of these communities happening there. So um, Felicia, can you share about um, Ferguson and, and, and who you are in the Ferguson um, community? Oh, good afternoon, good people. I'm Felicia Pulliam. And um, I'm happy to be here with you this afternoon. As it relates to Ferguson, when the Ferguson uprising began in 2014, after the murder of Michael Brown, like everyone else, I took to the streets in protest um, 
and was subsequently selected to serve as a member of the Ferguson Commission. So we wrote Forward Through Ferguson, A Pathway to Racial Equity, which is an excellent document and um, have been active <laughs> ever since then. I, I, would, I would say that service to the community is actually what I do. Um, what's different now? It's remarkably different now. Um, as you remember, in 2014, when the community was met with um, a militarized opposition, with tanks and tear gas and riot gear and snipers with live ammunition on roofs with barrels pointed at us, the world was shocked. The world was simply shocked to see a militarized response like that. And that's when we began to understand that police departments were militarized and that it was a problem in this country. Um, not seeing so much of that, <laughs> not seeing so, so much of that. Um, but we've got a lot of muscle memory here. And it was just wonderful to see the activist community um, reinvigorate themselves um, pull out the calls and <clears throat> have traditional groups that were leading during that time back on the streets. But what's amazing and encouraging and hopeful here is throughout the St. Louis metropolitan region to see actions organized by groups of people that stood in opposition to were quite defensive of their perspectives and their communities. Um, and now you're seeing actions in those communities where after six years of very dedicated work from many talented people here in the region, that there's a change in understanding. Um, so when I see protest in Ladue, um, one of the wealthiest zip codes in the country, and Clayton, another one of the wealthiest zip codes in the country, and see white families with white children with signs that say Black Lives Matter. <laughs> it's really quite remarkable. It's not something I would have anticipated. In fact, it was absolutely um, prohibited and dangerous and <laughs> those sorts of things. So um, that, is, that is the wonderful, wonderful change. Thank you for that, Felicia. And we're gonna hear more from Felicia about that journey she's been on and how to sustain action even when it implicates years and years um, at the end of our session today. So um, Stephen Danley is here from Camden, New Jersey. We're really lucky to have him in our network because he comes at this issue, knowing a lot about that Camden situation. And he's off to a youth protest soon. So Stephen, um, if you could share with us before you've got to go, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. So first of all, I just want to say it's an honor to be on the call with so many folks doing such amazing work. Um, still thinking about so much of what you're talking about. I'm a resident here of Camden. I've been here seven years. I'm a professor at the local university and often thinking about how we bridge these coalitions and continue this work. We're also looking at this through the, the looking glass in Camden, New Jersey. The police force here was disbanded in 2012. And so I wanted to just take a minute to share what that looks like and what, that hap what happened afterwards in Camden. After a police force is disbanded, there's tremendous pressure on politicians to declare mission accomplished. And that's what happened here. So even though the new police force was funded at a higher level, even though in the first year of the new police force, there were more police on the streets from 268 to 418. And even though we saw a broken window strategy of policing here, politicians have been taking a national victory lap. Um, in that first year, Tinted window summonses, which is a classic broken windows technique, went up 380% in the city. So you can imagine what happened next, excessive force complaints rose. And at that point, I think folks were really having a tough time. Someone I spoke to, a, a resident and friend here told me, when the new force came, it was like we all became suspects. 
But that's really where things started to turn around in Camden. In 2015, under pressure from um, the local NAACP, but also, frankly, from the national conversation where our friends from Ferguson were really pushing the Black Lives narrative movement forward, they caught kind of a burst of energy and you saw the police start to listen to local community members. Excessive force um, rules were rewritten here. Um, they were rewritten again in 2019, and now officers in Camden are actually required if their fellow officers are misusing force to step in and stop that from happening. And so you see excessive force, which went up early in the force, is actually down 95%. And so Camden's really a story about community vigilance and what it means to continue this work um, on and on. And so two quick updates about what that looks like today. You're seeing youth take up that um, baton kind of here and really pushing. That's where I'm going next to a youth march. And so we've seen this demand to take police out of our schools become one of the central demands of the movement here. And I'm really, really excited about that. And then the last thing I just say is uh, let's all make sure we also do this work at home in our own institutions. So one of the things we're trying to do at Rus Rutgers is um, to, to defund and um, and disband our own police force. At Rutgers, we have a police force all to our own. And so that work is just starting as well. So those are my thoughts from Camden. And again, it's an honor to be with you today. I really appreciate um, what you shared because that's a really great segue to the um, next piece, which is thinking about what we learn and um, how we make sure that we understand that this moves beyond just racist um, policy and police um, and violence. They're related, but this is more about what we have learned, what we have been socialized to understand, what have been, what, we've had a lens that perhaps gave us permission or perhaps gave us an understanding of the world that we now need to shift and change. And so I really want to bring online Langston Evans, Ruby Bafu, and K Karen Reese to help share with us um, what we need to understand um, and know in terms of um, what is the lifelong learning experience that, and what is the information that we need to um, consume a, as part of the journey of change? And what would be your advice about how we keep on learning? And so with that, I'll have Langston um, queue up first with Ruby and then Karen. Thank you, Langston. Yeah, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, have this opportunity to speak. And, and I want to speak to the uh, idea of sustainability. How do we maintain this as a commitment to lifelong learning? Um, and I'll talk briefly about sort of why, what, and how you might want to approach this project of lifelong learning. Um, first of all, when we see the things that have happened, when we've experienced the, the events of the world, um, people will ask the question of whose responsibility is it to act? Um, and my answer is every single person. Um, and whatever identities you hold and whatever experiences that you've had, that you have and that you will have, we all have the power to educate ourselves. We all have a power to make change, understanding that growing ourselves that is that first move that matters. Um, the cost of educating ourselves is low. The return on investment is infinite. Um, and then also we need to, we need to understand the way the world has been pre presented to us isn't exactly the way the world is. Um, we have to unlearn what is untrue. Um, and fourthly, education is a prerequisite for effective action. How do we know what's going on? We have to learn about what's happened before. We have to understand the resources that we have and our communities have and the world has to dismantle what's going on. We have to develop and hone the skills individually uh, and collectively so that we can move the world in the direction that we want to um, and know when the right time to use those skills are, the right way to use those skills and to use them for the right reason. Um, so when I think about that's sort of why we wanna do it and what we wanna look at um, in terms of education, there are a ton of resources. Um, the resource list that we have here is, is, is amazing. Um, and that's just the beginning. Um, so one way I wanna take a look at the lens is through the notion of systemic oppression. We have individual learning that we need to do, thinking about our, our privilege, thinking our unconscious bias. We have interactional. 
um, how are we engaging with others? How are we engaging in our personal lives? And then we have institutional and structural. Um, when we're learning, we want to make sure we start, in my view, with the individual so that when we grow, um, we can then take on effectively the structural and institutional. Um, and then the types of learning we want to think about is that there's knowledge, there's stuff out there, there's things that are out there that we want to learn. Um, but we want to learn around systems, around structures of power, not just trivia or facts. It's really about how do things work. We want to make sure that we get skills, skills to have the conversations in effective ways, skills to engage in the right time and the right place in order to make the change we want to see. And we want to put ourselves in experiences that may be uncomfortable, but allow us to grow as a person. Um, and then just lastly, some thoughts about some things we might want to consider as we're going through this journey of learning. Um, first, find a personal connection. Uh, whatever it is that you love, it will sustain you. If you love history, that's your connection. If you love athletics, that's your connection. Find something, hold on to it, think of it through the lens of systemic oppression. Um, be humble, you're not gonna learn it all at once and the learning isn't ever over. Um, be careful of the single story. Um, I don't believe that there's a single black perspective or experience. There are many people in the African diaspora and they all have their own stories and experiences. Um, so there isn't just one. Some of them agree, some of them disagree. But the idea is that if you listen and you learn, you'll see themes, you'll see convergences and you'll understand what the multiplicity of stories are and where the power lies. Um, understand you need to have some sense of the credibility of the information that you're looking at uh, who's talking and where are they talking about? Where are they talking from? What's their perspective and positionality? And why are they talking? What is their experience? Um, take time to reflect. Make sure that you allow yourself the process. As adults, we learn by reflecting and thinking about how we connect. And then lastly, make sure you have an accountability plan. You have a buddy, you have a system, you have a class, you have something that's going to keep you on this journey. Uh, for the rest of your life. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ruby Bafu. I'm a graduate student here in Madison. And my research looks at how Black girls experience school punishment. Um, I interview Black girls who attend any public, middle, or high school in Dane County to learn more about their experiences. Um, unfortunately, my work was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So instead of collecting interviews this summer, I've been reading newspaper articles to get a sense of what Black girls have been experiencing in Dane County schools. And one of the things that I've learned from reading these news articles has to do with the change in the discourse around policing and punishment, um, particularly around what it means to have cops in schools. So last week, the Madison Metropolitan School District stated that they plan to remove school resource officers from school buildings. And I'm really happy to hear that our own local school district plans to remove cops from schools. But my research using news articles, in addition to my own experiences living in Madison, remind me that this decision only came after years of hard work, emotional labor, and organizing from community leaders here in Madison. So I want to lift up the works, the work of folks from Freedom Inc., Urban Triage, and other community organizations that have consistently fought to protect Black youth and particularly Black girls. For the past two weeks, I've watched community organizers in Madison, particularly Black women, organize protests. And for the past two years that I've lived in Madison, I've watched folks from Freedom Inc. and members of the community take up space at school board meeting after school board meeting, demanding that the school board be held accountable for protecting Black youth by removing cops out of schools. The purpose of me highlighting the efforts of Black women in particular is to ensure that these women are not erased. If there's anything that I've learned from living in Madison, it's that Madisonians pride themselves in being liberal. But the issue is that white liberalism often makes us focus on the victories that have been won while ignoring the efforts that it took to get, to get there. So based off that, I just wanna offer some quick advice um, for those who are committed to racial justice and want to engage in a lifelong learning that's required to disrupt the ways in which white supremacy shapes society. So first, I would say it's really important to protect and uplift Black women, girls, gender nonconforming, and queer folks, because these are the people who are on the front lines fighting for racial justice, and the same people who are arguably some of the most vulnerable when it comes to violence. So I would advise you to watch out for us, ask us how you can support us, and be ready to hold space for our needs. 
Two, I would say that you should definitely show up in real time and just ask how you can be helpful. That might mean donating, showing up at protests, donating money to bail funds, just being helpful in whatever way you can be, but asking for the support that is required in the present moment. The last thing I would say is that um, it's really important to do the work of learning. And when you're learning, be ready to deal with frustration. As a researcher, I spend so much time online just like learning new things in my research. And I want to acknowledge that there's a lot of privilege in being an academic because I've been taught how to use Google, how to do research, and that's not a privilege that everyone has. But I do think that whether you're a researcher or not, taking time to learn about issues that you're unfamiliar with isn't as scary as you think but be ready to deal with that personal frustration as well as the frustration that other people might experience when you ask them for resources, for example. We all can do the work. We have a Google Doc full of resources. Google is there. So I definitely think that like starting as an individual and putting in that work for learning is a great place to start. And I'll stop there. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Reese. I'm the Vice President of Research and Education at Nehemiah Community Development Corporation. We're in Madison, Wisconsin. And we've been around for almost 30 years now. Um, and we do a couple of different things at, at the organization. Uh, we have um, one, the original purpose of the organization is to serve black families in the Madison area. So we do direct programming in areas of K through 12. So education, um, self-esteem, self-identity kinds of things. And then we also have a big programming arm focused on re-entry. So looking at uh, men and women who are coming home from prison, making sure they have housing, making sure they have support and mentorship um, and are connected to jobs and employment. But in addition to programming, um, programming is always really important. But again, this just addresses the individual. We also need to look at the systemic side of things to make sure that we are changing these systems and structures that um, have been built since the beginning of this country on a racial hierarchy and um, a racial power structure. The systems focus for Nehemiah really started in 2014 with our Justified Anger Initiative. And this started with our CEO, um, Reverend Alex G wrote an article in the local newspaper about his experiences as a black man. And the article was entitled Justified Anger. And this, this led to a pretty big community response. And a lot of the response was from white allies in the Madison community who um, for many reasons were just starting to realize that um, you know, this issue is rooted in racism and, and they wanted to figure out how they could contribute to this. So in addition to things like um, meeting with stakeholders from different um, sectors of the community, like criminal justice, education, and economic development, we've developed a series of, of educational components that um, are included and open for everyone to participate in, but a big focus has been on developing our white allies. So one of those programs is our um, nine-week US Black History class known as Black History for a New Day. The focus is not just on black history, it really is US history, but incorporating the pieces of history that most of us never learned, um, which is how has race specifically shaped the way our country has developed. So for many of us white people, um, you know, we understand personal racism. That's something that we learn about from an early age. You know, we want to um, be accepting of all people regardless of their race, but many of us have also been taught color blindness is the way to go, which we know is a very uh, detrimental and damaging way of looking at things. We want to, um, we, we notice color, we're human beings, of course we notice that, and we want to be able to accept that and um, figure out how do we undo some of these things that, that have developed in our country. And so, the purpose of the class really is to help people understand why we still are entrenched in racism today, even after the civil rights movement, which we learn about in school, after Martin Luther King Jr. and after Obama, um, we're still dealing with these deeply in, entrenched um, systems and structures. So by taking people back to the court starts in um, Africa before slavery began, and that's a really important start because most of our racial justice education uh, platforms and our education in schools really start with slavery as if that was the beginning of black people's existence. Um, and we want people to understand that, that you know, this, this is far bigger than that. There were, you know, cultures and communities and <clears throat> ways of being before um, people in this country kidnapped um, and stole people, human beings from Africa to come and build our economy. 
So we start there and then the course moves through time um, pretty much up to the civil rights movement. So we, we teach people about um, you know, how slavery formed the economy in our country, um, that the United States would not be the capitalistic society it is today if we had not had our economy built on things like cotton, things like um, you know, sugar, and um, those those commodities that are if if we had not had that we have not would have not built an economy. And then how did that change as we moved through the Civil War, as we moved through um, the civil rights moment, and um, came to our present day? So by by teaching that, we hope that white people would be able to frame their um, their their concept of racism and then use their own um, knowledge of skills and then. We also teach them some next steps and how they can use their power and privilege to move forward in some of these things. So you can find out more information about that, Nehemiah, N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H dot org. Thanks. Thank you so much, all of you. So again, always dissatisfying because it's only enough to just make you continue to be hungry, which is actually a good thing for us to be, which is we've got to actively learn. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Beth so she can kick us off for our next round of theme. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Um, so we, we figured out pretty early in our discussions around this that we wanted to make space in this conversation for how to take care of ourselves and others as we proceed in this journey. And this is going to look different for all of us because of who we are and the way that we're particularly experiencing this moment and other moments of, um, I guess, heightened awareness of racism in our communities. Um, I know for me as a white woman, um, I can experience the need for self-care um, all the time, just in regular life. Um, and sometimes also in my own efforts um, specific to this issue. And I also know the overwhelming feeling that I had um, over the last couple of weeks when I was thinking about all of my black friends and colleagues and thinking about what they were going through, which was completely different and how I could possibly offer anything um, just on a personal level to make sure that they were coping as well as possible. So um, I am not an expert in this area, but I am going to pass the torch now to a couple of people who are, um, and we'll go in order of Eric Upchurch, Rosa Thompson, and Corinda Rainey Moore, who all have different angles on this issue, um, but are going to share with us about how we can take care of ourselves and others um, in this journey um, and if you all would be willing to just share kind of what your professional or personal background is to the issue as you give your comments, that would be great. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. So I will start. Um, what's up, everybody? I am Eric Stephen of Church II. Um, I'm really just a community servant, but I guess my more relevant role to this conversation is uh, that I'm a, a life and business strategist um, and one of the founders of the Movement Fund, which rewards partners who help raise funds that go to make grants for meeting needs, building awareness and advocacy and action. And I'm one of a few founders that came out of a lot of community organizing uh, back in 2014, uh, 2013, up until now. Um, and we did so much in the way of community work and mobilization and you know addressing the isms and one of the things that we realized was that, or that, that I was able to, to recognize within myself is that even in our effort to solve these problems, we were also causing harm within our groups, um, within our teams. And I can imagine that folks watching this have experienced some of this where passionate people are you know, contributing to the, the issue um, and exemplifying that. Um, and we sort of, I, I sort of noticed this this uh, policing of the movement, so to speak, where we have this approach where if we can just learn enough and if we can just, you know, do, 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 then we're gonna make progress. And we, you know, we can't rest. We have to make sure that we're out there and, and we're, we're taking this sort of policing approach, this rule following, you know, law and order approach to uh, uh, racial equity and social justice that in and of itself is rooted in the same kind of white supremacist, patriarchal capitalistic culture that we, we fight when we fight police violence. So um, just to give you an idea of how deeply rooted 
our habits are here. And one of the ways in which I've learned to help teams and individuals address these, especially within myself, is to take care of myself, to take that rest. When you're sick, when you're ill, you got to go to sleep. You got to lay down, don't you? You know, so sometimes laying down is revolutionary in and of itself. Sometimes that self-care is revolutionary. It is a critical part of the movement because it's only when you are still that you're able to really take a look at what's around you. So many of us are doing, doing, doing so much that we can't really recognize how we are contributing to the problem and how we can contribute to other folks' solutions. So that's just there. Uh, one thing that comes from, that allows us to get closer to that is clarity. Um, and, and one of the uh, courses that we teach as a part of Movement Fund, um, movementfund.com, just how it sounds, uh, we talk about the need for clarity as a function of looking at where you are, which takes some reflection, understanding where you're trying to go, and deeply asking that question, why, multiple times. This is a part of, uh, they talk about this in uh, Lean Six Sigma, which a lot of companies use to you know, streamline their processes, is asking yourself why a number of times to get to a root, a deeper level of understanding of where that behavior, where that goal is coming from. And then of course, the fourth area for clarity is understanding what you're gonna need to get there. I talk about this because the plan is only just the plan. And if you have one, you have one of the key elements of well-being, which is purpose. And this is coming out of the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds, um, well-being being a function of awareness, introspection, connection, and purpose. But the issue with purpose is that, again, in the movement, we, we attack our purpose and we attack the people that are in line with our purpose. Um, and if we don't see that lining up the way that we think it needs to, then we feel this feeling of defeat and we have this kind of like, oh no, what's gonna happen? What we, we lost. Um, it, self care requires a, a viewpoint that goes beyond, and this might be an unpopular opinion, but that goes beyond our end goal. If our end goal is all that there is, then we're not able to really celebrate the small win, celebrate the fact that we just woke up today and we didn't do that thing that we've been practicing not doing. Um, focus on the fact that even though we didn't reach that full end goal and we, not, might, we might not live to see the end of all oppression, I personally am becoming a better person. And by that function, I'm making other people, I'm helping other people to become better persons as well. The movement is internal and too much of our actions are focused on uh, uh, those people over there and making sure that those people over there are doing what they need to do um, if we, we, we also have to do what we need to do and lead by example, if anything else, by really introspecting and looking at ourselves, taking that time to reflect. And for those who don't know, um, the steps, you, we, we practiced it when we first started, right? It's really being able to tune into your sensations, your bodily sensations, the things that are happening, happening naturally, your natural thoughts, all the layers of your thoughts, and really getting curious about those heightening your sensitivity to those things by tuning into those subtle areas. And, and uh, I'm, I'm getting notes, I gotta wrap up. There's so much to share, but I think uh, uh, really just focusing on introspection, realizing that we're not our thoughts, but it is our duty to work on ourselves. And sometimes that means sitting down and, and being chill. I'll end with this. There's a really cool short video clip of a young man who's talking about doing work and his mom is, trying to get him to do work. And he said, I need to rest so that God can work on me. Um, and he talks about a car being at rest when it's, it's being built. So allow yourself to rest, realize that that is part of the movement. And even if you're not reaching the end goal, you are getting closer. Thanks, Eric. Hi, I'm Rosa Thompson. Um, I'm the founder of the Black Girl Magic Conference, which is a, a conference for Black girls um, in Madison and the surrounding area to celebrate them, to um, encourage them and just to introduce them to positive role models in the community. And I'm also an MMSD educator. So today um, I'm gonna be talking to you just about self-care as it relates to your children. So as we know, um, 
you know, there's a lot going on. There's COVID, there's um, videos of black people being murdered going around um, and our kids are picking up on that. Um, so even younger kids who haven't watched the videos of the murders, they can hear the fear, the urgency, the anger and their parents' voices. They may have been at protests, but still not understand why they're there. Um, and our elementary and older students, um, children, they'll likely have overheard adult conversation or been exposed to um, what's happening via social media or conversations with friends. So um, our kids are exposed, whether we know it or we expose them directly or not. Um, so some things that we can do. Um, kids need to see their, their parents taking care of themselves first. I mean, if you, if you as a parent, aren't healthy or as a caregiver to younger kids, if you're not healthy and taking care of yourself, you can't care for your children adequately. Um, and remember kids show stress in multiple ways. They might withdraw, they might lose interest in their regular activities. You, they might, it might come out as fear or crying or just um, not wanting to participate in regular daily activities. So just noticing in your children what, um, how they show their stress um, and being aware of how your kid might communicate with you that they need more care. Um, and when we talk about taking care of ourselves and taking care of our kids, it's important that we take care of our kids and ourselves with our mind, body, and spirit. All three are important. Um, ways to take care of our kids, our youth in our lives, uh, read books with them, write in a journal, meditate, sing, dance, go outside, um, daily affirmations, play a game. I mean, just give them a break from whatever they're doing and just find joy in, um, in life. Because as we know, um, joy is a part of our resistance. It's important to celebrate um, the good moments in life. And when we talk about don't just read, don't uh, reading books, don't just read books about struggles and civil rights movements, but really read books about black joy, about black art, about the celebration of black culture. Um, it's important that our kids know that um, black culture is not only about a struggle. We have many, many parts to our culture that are important and it's important to shed light on them. And just remember that um, as, uh, people, especially for, this is particular for our, our black kids, that we have a rich history of resilience and that we will get through this and we should celebrate that resilience. So really figure out what works for you, what works for your family and how you can take care of yourself as a parent, as a caregiver, and then that will transfer over to your children. Thanks. Hello, um, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Corinda Rainey Moore, and I just wanted to just talk about some of the things um, that folks can do in, in terms of taking care of themselves. I think Rosa and Eric talked a lot about it, but one of the things that I think is important is that recognizing that um, what we have all been watching and experiencing these past couple weeks have been traumatic. And when you think about trauma and um, some of the life situations that some, some of us were already in that was also trauma, um, such as um, uh, living in food deserts, those, were tra those things are traumatic. Not having access to transportation is traumatic. Then you add on um, uh, what we've been witnessing with watching some of the video of the of the guy taking his last of of Floyd um of, of Mr. Floyd taking his last breath, um, we're seeing that, and then we hear again like yesterday that another person was was shot and killed by the police. So all of those things are traumatic, and I say that because folks handle trauma in different ways. And when you think about trauma, it's really important that you do an assessment of what your needs are, and not only just what your needs are, but what kinds of things are helpful for you um, when you're thinking about taking care of your health. For me, that might be reading a good book, 
um, that might be um, hanging out with some girlfriends or um, hanging out with family, spending time with my grandkids, or it could even be uh, praying. Um, so for me, though, that's what's important for me when I think that I'm going through a lot of stuff and then finding someone that I could actually talk through it. But in other cases, it is also involves maybe perhaps reaching out to some some um, professionals who can offer some professional help, such as therapy. And just so you, um, and the reason I talk about trauma so much and the importance of get, getting healthcare is because I worked in the healthcare field for 27 years. And um, working in, in healthcare for 27 years, you saw folks dealing with a lot of stuff. And you also saw folks that wasn't really willing to reach out and get the help that they need um, because of the stigma that was out there around that. And I say that stigma is still out there. It's decreasing more and more each day. Um, but don't let the stigma be a hindrance for you getting what you need in terms of getting the help that you need. And if you're thinking about whether or not you're able to connect with folks who look like you, there are folks um, who are working in the field who look just like you, and you can find that person. And sometimes you got to shop around as, as the same way that you shop around for that perfect dress for an event that you want to go to. Sometimes you got to shop for a therapist, that one that connects with you, one that understands you, one that gets you. Um, and one that you feel comfortable with. So don't be afraid to, to get um, uh, 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 go out and seek a second opinion from folks because you are entitled to that and you do that um, with other things. So why not do it with a therapist in order to get yourself healthy? It really is about focusing on your mental health, your physical health and, and your uh, spiritual health and well-being. And as folks said, um, as Eric mentioned, is when you're going through trauma, it is really important that you take the time to relax, um, turn off some of the noise, and that means sometimes get off of social media so that you can find time to, to just reset, reflect, and then um, move into action and whatever that action may be for yourself, because that is an important piece just like someone who has cancer. If you have cancer and you had surgery at the hospital, you come home, you don't just go right back to doing what you were doing. You take time to, to heal um, and to, uh, uh, to, to relax and to heal. And when you're suffering from trauma and all of these traumatic events, you have to do the same thing. You have to give your body time to heal, your body, your mind, and, and spirit uh, a, a chance to heal. So to me, that is really important. And I think that folks forget that healing piece um, that needs to take place. So for me, it's finding that joy in whatever way that works for you. That doesn't look the same um, as your friend or your sisters. It is really what works for you. Um, and not paying attention to what other people are doing, but doing what makes you happy. Um, and these times you have to do that and you have to be willing to um, shut down the noise in order to do that. So with that, I'll just um, stop there because I know we're in, in, uh, on the crunch of time. So I just want to say thank you uh, for allowing me to speak and I appreciate your opportunity for, to listen. All right, thank you all of you for sharing your perspectives about what it is we need to do to give each other um, support and more importantly, take care of ourselves and take care of the people who are doing this work with us. So next, we're really going to talk about how do we exert influence in our spheres. So whether it be family, friends, in your neighborhood, at work, or even when you're out um, doing things out and about and in the community, you know, what, where are those opportunities? And so it's gonna be um, Precious Woodley is going to be speaking with us and then also myself um, to really talk about and offer some suggestions on what to think about. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll kind of cue us up on this. And um, what I think is first and foremost is that we have to understand that when it comes to exerting influence, um, 
we have to, we live in fear many times, right? And especially fear around um, topics or about efforts that maybe we're just not sure, am I, am I, can I do this? And what I want to remind everyone is that we are always perfectly imperfect and we are not called to be perfect, we are called to have courage and to lead into our courage. And so don't be frozen by your fear, use your courage and, and lean into that courage to take those steps necessary to make sure that when you see something, hear something, um, that you use your courage to step in and call it out because that's what you can do. You can call it out. And that's called being, that's leading, that's modeling, that's setting the, um, the pace for how action can happen. And it also means that in that is also being a leader. So really being someone who can influence and guide and direct how change can happen because if other people can relate to you and, and you see yourself as someone who may, you're unsure, you leaning into your courage and demonstrating your power, you are then modeling for others who may also like you be unsure about what it looks like to um, you know, step in and disrupt and make change and be an influence for change. That's how it starts. And so that in essence is leadership. We all have to not be sitting on the circle or on the line of the circle waiting for someone else to do the work. We have to do it. Even when we are living in fear, we have to lean into our courage. And by leaning into our courage, we are growing and we're developing. And so I can't say that enough. And when you lead into your courage, what you're doing is you're using your power. Power is voice, power is action, power is making a decision to do something, to change something and to disrupt. And it is a choice. And it is a choice that you have, every one of us, every day, every single second of the day, we have power if we choose to use it. And so the question will always be, what are you choosing to do with your power? How are you going to use it? And are you going to give it up and be silent, which then makes you complicit? And it isn't enough to say that you don't know or you are uninformed. It's your job, it's your role as a human being to understand that there is much that is going on around us. So what can you do to use your power, to use your influence to make change? And so that's really thinking about when can you be an advocate in your private space? And when can you be a uh, advocate in your public space and really thinking about those moments? And again, because we're perfectly imperfect, that means that sometimes you may not always act the way that you want, but act in humility and understand that there will be another opportunity that you need to take the opportunity to lean in and to make sure that you advocate for change and you use that sphere of influence. And so, when using your sphere of influence, you know, know your environment. There are places where you feel confident, you feel comfortable in what you know or how you navigate. Those are the perfect spaces to be able to lean into change. Um, understanding the change that you want. So perhaps you hear somebody say something about those people. So what you can do is say, excuse me, you know, we have a culture where we want to be inclusive. And so we don't try to other people by saying those people. We, they have a name and we make sure that we honor and we say their name and we make sure that we are inclusive in our practices and ensure that people feel like they belong. And so if you're going to speak about another person or another group of individuals, say their name and acknowledge that they belong in this space. Um, when you see something happen, um, you know, you are in the line, you know, at the, you're in the line somewhere and you see people saying something or doing something, um, working collectively together, because when you make that move to disrupt and say, I don't think that's right, Many times other people will step in with you and agree with you and will be part of making that change. So understanding that not in all situations are you alone, 
but sometimes you may be the one to make that first step. And so being genuine in your desire to disrupt and to change is how you use your agency and your advocacy. And that's how you model um, what it means to be a change agent. And you ask questions, ask questions about, well, I know that this is how we've done this in the past, but I'm just curious if we're trying to make ch change in our organization and we say that we want to have these kinds of outcomes, asking questions about what do we need to do differently in order to make that change happen and not lean into, um, well, let's do it this way because that's the way it's always been done. So there are opportunities for you to ask questions, to be able to step up and step into a moment um, and know that you won't always get it right. But what does happen is you disrupt and by disrupting, you shift and you change the narrative and you change what happens. And so that's really important in thinking about what it takes to be sphere of influence. And when you're with family and friends, you know, it's talking to them and asking them about, you know, how do they come to under that, understand that information or say, you know, I've been doing a lot of personal work and I'm starting to understand that I don't know you know, the things that I thought I knew or the things that I thought I understood about a particular group of people or about particular issues, I'm learning that I, I'm, I have to change my mind because some things, there have been things that have been going on that I didn't understand. I didn't understand that because we didn't learn it in school or I didn't understand it because I didn't take time to understand that there might be a different um, experience that someone else was having, even though I felt like maybe we were the same. I'm learning we're not the same. And so having that conversation about how many times the same actions or same use of um, tools or opportunities can play out differently. And so being willing to open that conversation up and break that out and have that conversation with a friend or family member is really important. And especially with white people, You've got to have that conversation in your own small private groups. You've got to be able to practice. You've got to be able to push each other and you've got to be able to challenge each other because we all have been socialized and normalized to believe certain things that actually are not true. So how do we shift that? How do we disrupt that? So with that, again, never satisfying enough, but we've got so many wonderful people that we need to hear from. I really would like to bring forth um, Precious Woodley. Um, she is a childhood. Child. Oh, go ahead. I was going to introduce you, but girl, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Precious Woodley, and I have served in many different spaces um, from early childhood all the way up um, to youth development. And so I'll share a little bit about my background um, as to how I am credible to share within the particular space um, and lead into the resources and strategies um, from my own personal experience um, that has helped me along the way. So I am a parent and a caregiver as well as a community member. Um, professionally, as I stated, I've served in many different spaces from teaching to educational coordinating to administrative administrative roles from the inner city of Madison all the way out into the outskirts um, in regards to the rural areas in Wisconsin. Um, I am a black woman um, in a white man's world understanding that I do not, that that if it doesn't work, um, if, if I don't do the work, then who will? Um, my motto is saving the world one kid at a time. And what I have been um, experiencing, especially the last two weeks, is getting involved with many different youth, as it seems um, that the youth are understanding the change, no matter the color. Um, they're understanding the change that needs to happen, not only within our own city, but nationally as well. Um, and so while protesting, a 16-year-old protester shared that Black lives are more important than white feelings. Understanding that we live in a predominantly white space and as an African-American woman that can be challenging if our community that we live in is not as open to equitable opportunities processes as well as um, the resources overall to be able to support the community holistically. Um, I'm involved in many different diverse circles with individuals with a wide variety of experiences and expertise. Um, hence the resources that um, have supported me personally um, is what I am sharing today. 
to hopefully help others. Um, so these resources include safe spaces. Safe spaces can be different for many different people, um, depending on your background and depending on what um, you actually have accessible to you. So for example, mine um, consists of church, um, nature, um, wellness centers uh, within the community, um, as well as connecting with those different people within those centers. Also, um, positive outlets, um, finding new hobbies um, that I always try to look at a situation and celebrate what is white what is right within the situation. And so I'm um, understanding that it's like, okay, we're in um, a pandemic. We were in quarantine. What are the new hobbies um, when it comes to like being able to like art expression, um, whether it's uh, creating new crafts, whether it's um, new different things that I find um, to do with my daughter, um, but definitely finding um, different things to do within her hard situation. Um, also a support circle. It is so important to ensure and to understand that it takes a village. Um, we need more bucket fillers. Um, and in the realm of education, what that means is we're completely on E and we need to be filled up. And so how do we do that if we do not have a support circle um, to be able to support support us um, when you are feeling down and even praising um, a person when they are doing right as well so that you're able to balance what that feedback looks like um, and build a rapport with the person um, and having those conversations. As um, My next comment is mental health. Mental health is huge. Um, saying that you are not okay is okay. Um, I think it's really important that you identify what a trigger is for you um, and what um, your communication style is like and being able to have these conversations. Um, it's okay to be ignorant to a situation, but we, again, it all goes back to the willingness and the openness that we have to be able um, to be educated um, for the betterment of your knowledge as well as the knowledge that you're sharing to others. Um, lastly is to check out. that It's okay to just simply check out um, when it comes to social media, when it comes to your surrounding circle. Um, it's okay to have those moments of alone time to reboot um, for you to be able to readjust and recenter. Um, because if you are not the best you that you can be, how can you be the best um, whether it's director, professor, daughter, mother, whatever role um, that you may play in your different areas of life, how can you be that if you do not ensure that you take care of yourself? So in regards to ways that I've um, supported families and the communities that we serve collectively together, I'm creating those safe spaces that's um, imperative and collectively um, because one organization or one person um, can't do um, the work that's needed alone. So how can we all work together collectively to ensure that the job is done as well as creating school community partnerships um, as I have worked in many different out of school learning spaces. So understanding what that looks like to be able to support the family effectively. How are we connecting with the schools um, as community-based sites? Um, I also think it's really important to meet the community where they are, um, whether it comes to community events. We, a lot, of, a lot of us work in really large spaces, but how are we actually getting into the communities that we serve to meet the people right where they are? Um, that also goes along with canvassing and being an engaged in, um, personable leader. Um, I think that's really important. Also, as a leader, for me to be able to model what a resilience leader is. So me being able to acknowledge that self-care is important, um, that also being able to support your company culture is everyone on board um, to be able to ensure that everyone is on board for that self-care to take care of themselves to, in order to be the best leaders that they can be. Um, in regards to strategies, um, I kind of gather this idea of the four A's. And so that's acknowledgement, acceptance, accountability, and advocacy. Um, and in regards to um, acknowledgement, what do you need? Um, and what do what does your healing look looks like? Um, I'm very much so from a trauma-informed care um, foundation. And I really feel like it's really important for us to understand um, that there, there is trauma is there and that there is a need for acknowledgement to be there. And so how do we um, support our participants, our community, and them understanding that we are here to say what happened versus what's wrong. Um, just the simple, just the simple details of how you act something and how you're approaching something, um, whether it's time to listen or is it, or is it a time to talk? Um, in regards to acceptance, it's our reality. Um, trauma is going to happen every day from this, and trauma can be as small to as big as someone. So we have to understand that different levels of trauma are there. So how do we help? Um, 
people embrace it and then support it effectively. Um, accountability. What can we do within our control to make whatever that it is better, that it is different for everybody, whether it could be a housing concern, whether it could be um, transportation, whether it could be um, any type of transition that a person is going through in their life. How can we support them in understanding what they can have control um, over and having that accountability within their life? Um, the last thing, um, being an advocate, and I think Annette definitely um, uh, focused a lot of what she shared on being an advocate. Um, and I said, be an advocate or being, being an ally. Speak up. Um, when you are comfortable, that's complacency. When you are uncomfortable, there is still work to be done as there is an unchanging world that we live in. Um, so ensuring that going against the grain is definitely hard. And I know that personally and professionally. But when something is the same and when something is the same and there's no different being made, then different must be done to create different results. And so it's really important um, within organizations that we're in, as well as our city overall, nationally, we understand that what is already present, something isn't working. So what isn't working, there needs to be a change. And so there needs to be more people um, like many of us on this call to be an advocate. And we need each other to do that, to continue to speak up, to make those changes that is going to better our community overall. Um, I'll end with saying the biggest room in all of us is the room of improvement and um, be open, be willing and ready as you and your voice and your work matters. Well, Precious, thank you so very much. We really appreciate your wisdom here and you definitely covered some, some ground for us. And I just wanna reiterate that it's really important to think about Precious and other folks in the early childhood and children and family spheres um, who are advocating about how families can actually have an influence on creating the next generation of humans who are living their lives in an anti-racist way. And so um, I just wanna also point out that that resource document has a lot of really great stuff about um, resources for families um, and how they can have that influence with their own children and, and their communities of parents and children. Um, and I think the takeaway of this section is just really, you know, even if you don't see yourself as a leader of an organization, um, or an activist even, you can still have an influence in the areas of your life where you do have um, a role and where you interact with other people. And I know that we are still seeking some good materials on how to have difficult conversations, which is something people have been interested in to put into that document. So if anybody has those, please share them. Um, but keep an eye on that document because we're going to keep trying to um, populate that over time for all of you in your individual spheres of influence um, so that you can have whatever um, part of this process that you're able to with the levers that you have at your disposal. So we're going to make up some time in these next two sections and they're a little bit interactive and a little different than the ones that we've done before. So in the next section, we're going to talk about the notion of support. So as a Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies and all of you I'm sure would agree, we know that there are lots and lots of organizations already out there that have already been doing the work of racial justice and a lot of the related issues that we've been talking about um, in our communities and in our circles over the last couple of weeks. And our resource document does list out a bunch of different organizations that people in our network have suggested to support, but we know that all of you have organizations that you know of that you might recommend that we support. And we'd love you to add to that conversation. And we'd also like to acknowledge that for everybody, there's probably a couple of different organizations that they like the best of all and that really resonate with them. And we just want to encourage that you use your time and treasure to support those organizations that have already been engaged in the work. So please go ahead and now in the Facebook chat, um, start listing out, if you would, um, the organizations that you really like and that you think are doing the good work out there that you would encourage others to check out and support. And while we take just about two minutes to do that, um, and we will track the responses and put them back in our resource document for future reference, um, our Associate Director of the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies is gonna just share a little bit about her experiences um, connecting with some really important white ally organizations um, in Wisconsin and um, their national affiliates. So Amy Hilgendorf is gonna share, thank you. Hi, thanks everyone. Yeah, um, during this time we've heard more and more calls for um, the white people to do their work and to take up the load of um, this fight for racial justice that has historically been put upon people of color. 
So um, while I think there's many different efforts that we should take part in, including um, being present in lots of multiracial spaces, uh, there is also a role for uh, white anti-racist spaces and engaging with organizations there. Um, these organizations can be a really valuable space for the allies 101 learning um, that uh, it's important that we do with each other and not ask people of color to teach us what we don't know. Um, in my experience, these are also really, really, really important spaces for continuing to be engaged. Um, in these spaces, you can connect with other white folks who are really committed to this work. And when you feel like, you know, I'm just gonna go back, back to how I lived before and forget about this, uh, these people will move you out of that space and also show you what's possible in terms of having conversations with your kids about police abolition or um, engaging with those difficult white folks that we all seem to have in our families and friends um, and not backing away from those conversations. Uh, so here in Madison, um, there's a couple of key organizations that I encourage people to connect with and that includes Groundwork which is a white anti-racist organization that is affiliated with um, Surge or Standing Up for Racial Justice. That's a national organization that people can look up. Um, and uh, if you're not in Madison, you can find a local chapter or get support in starting your own. Uh, Families for Justice is also a organization um, here in Madison to consider, especially if you're thinking about um, parenting and how to engage your kids in anti-racist work um, as white parents, especially. And then there's also here in Madison, lots of learning opportunities through witnessing whiteness groups, the Justified Anger courses, um, and also the Madison Institutes for Healing Racism, uh, which are all spaces to do some of that deep learning, but then stay connected to people and um, engage in actions together to hold each other accountable uh, and all that good stuff. Sorry, I had a little trouble unmuting my audio. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Um, we're gonna keep the comments section of the Facebook Live page going and we're seeing some comments come in from our presenters here on Zoom too, and those will be added to our resource document. Um, and we also have gotten some comments that some of you may be having trouble accessing the resource document. We think it should be public access and it shouldn't be a problem, but we'll double check on that for all of you. There are links all over our Facebook page and we'll, we'll keep checking on it to make sure you can get at that. Um, so I'm going to have Annette introduce us to the action step of our session here today ever so briefly. That is actually going to um, bring you to a worksheet that you can use um, for your own plan. But we also only have Lisa with us for six more minutes, and we wanted her to be able to share about her journey of sustaining efforts a little bit as we get into how to take not only action, but to keep that action going. So Annette, if you would say a few words about the worksheet and the purpose of that, and then yep. turn to Lisa with time for her to share about how she's sustained over the years, that would be great. Absolutely. So um, we've been talking about what the work is. So part of the work is the action. So we put together a worksheet to help you start planning out the action for the movement forward. And so what it does is it takes each theme um, that we've talked about today and it asks you to make an action, to make a commitment. What will you do today? What will you do this week? What will you do for the remainder of June? What will you do between July and August? What will you do between September and December? And what will you do in 2021? Because the movement doesn't sustain itself and the work doesn't happen unless you take action. And so this worksheet is all about the action that you can take under what you need to learn for self-education, um, what you need to do to take of yourself and others, how you exert an uh, influence in other spheres, how do you support the work, and then also, of course, act what actions do you need to take? And then of course, sustain. How are we gonna to commit to making sure that this isn't just a movement moment and that it really truly is a movement forward that we stay in and lean in. And with that, I wanna make sure that we talk to Lisa um, as well as Felicia, because I think they can give us a lot of insight on what that looks like given the work that they've done. So with that, Lisa.
Okay, sorry. Okay, back on. So I think that I'm, you know, I really have to um, send a big thank you to appreciation to Precious. I'm a, you know, being a fellow educator, you know, and looking at like the impact that education in our system has and how we can, you know, that, that change begins there. I think I really, I really do believe that. And then how we, how we teach our children and what we can do to promote um, the equality and balance in life and society and, you know, even within our classrooms and within our homes and communities um, really starts with those children. And uh, I had my first year pre-K <laughs> a few years ago and I used to be so scared to teach kindergarten pre-K, but I just love them. Um, you know, action and what can we do to sustain, you know, I, I again, looking back at, at Mr. Danley's comments about, you know, from the last one about being to continue to put the pressure on to stay engaged and um, don't, you know, if you blink like uh, that things just can tend to pop go backwards fast as faster than they go forward. Um, and how important it is to remember that um, change, you know, it does take time, but again, you know, as he says, you have to keep pushing. You really have to keep pushing. Our community now, we have to, um, we're looking at dealing with the pandemic, but also dealing in our American Indian community with um, this whole riot and the attacks and the assaults on people, militarization and, and such, it's not new for our people. You know, look at Wounded Knee 1973 and the armed occupation and um, defense of the Wounded Knee village in Wounded Knee, South Dakota, and looking at Standing Rock and just it started with young people trying to defend and, and protect the water there against the pipeline, you know, the Dakota Access Pipeline, and how that quick, how quickly it shot to militarization and you know, I'm just done, uh, done looking at, done, done, done looking at rubber bullet wounds and concussion grenade wounds. And, you know, I've seen and personally met people that have been injured by those both last week or two weeks ago. And also, you know, two years ago or three years ago at from Standing Rock, you know, my mother was participating in Wounded Knee and Again, in listening to the conversation too, also is hearing about self-care, you know, and self-care and community care um, to keep going forward. We must, we do have to take those, those breaks. So last night, our community conducted, a, we call it a pop-up round dance or pop-up um, community dance of powwow. And it was an unplanned spur of the moment event that had brought our community together to, to eat and to feast, to dance in that circle and to hear our beautiful drums and just acknowledge the fact of who we are. And we have to, again, we have to continue to remain, um, maintain that relationship with earth and with each other and maintain that through our cultural protocols and our, our cultural traditions. So to keep going forward, you know, what do we do to sustain that? Those are some of the things, you know, coming from an indigenous lens, you know, what we have to do to keep moving forward. So it's also building alliances. It's also making those connections. And I'm going to have to sign out in a second here. I have a meeting. Um, I have one from France and then we go and meet with the city council and talking about the funding and dismantling the police. So I really appreciate everyone's um, words and participation today. Um, and I apologize because I'm gonna jump off early here and thank you for allowing me this time to share and you know, give, bring voice from our indigenous community. Yes, and Lisa, thank you so much for your lifetime of work. That's exactly why we wanted you to talk about sustaining the effort and um, thank you. And we'll stay in touch about next steps and we hope we'll stay connected with what's happening there in Minneapolis and, and your communities. Thank of, you. Um, collaboration. So thank, thank you. you. All right. Yes. Good day, everybody. So not only is Lisa someone who has a lifetime of work under her belt, um, but while we look at that action plan and we think about sustainability, we also wanted to give Felicia, um, who spoke with us earlier and has 
been doing the work in Ferguson on multiple levels to share a little bit about her advice um, for a few moments about how to sustain these efforts. And then we'll try to pull back together after Felicia's comments and just do a little bit of recentering on how are we going to use that action plan that Annette introduced us to, and then how can we, as the hosts of this talk, um, and hopefully hosts of some next sessions or talks or steps, um, help you all sustain. So with that, I'll turn it over to Felicia to give us some of her wisdom from Ferguson and her life's work, and then we'll come back together for some closing um, thoughts and next steps. Well, good afternoon again. Thank you, Mary Beth, um, for some time to talk about this. What I would like to share with you is that this is very difficult work. And you have to be committed for the long haul. This is not something that you can step into, do a little thing, and then step out of, um, because that is not what success looks like. So I want to share a part of this journey. Um, so I shared with you that I was a member of the Ferguson Commission and we wrote the commission report. It is forward through Ferguson, a pathway to racial equity. If you're not familiar with that document, I'm gonna ask you to Google it and look it up. It is not about Ferguson. It is about the conditions on the ground in black and brown communities across this country. If you have an issue in your country, please believe that there is a call to action. There is a depth of resources and research in that document. It wasn't just the commissioners, but um, experts from around the country and around the globe that tapped in to help us put together that very um, good document. And what I really like about it is it'll help you understand for those steps, for those calls to action, what your goals could be and who to hold accountable. So we got that document out and of course it's digital. Please access that. And as we were working on it and coming to a conclusion of that work, um, I began to realize because of the work that I'd done in city of Kenlock, Missouri, a historic African-American city, trying to save that city from the progress of economic development. <laughs> um, that's another story, Google Kenlock, that's not what we're talking about. But from that experience, I realized that community may not have the capacity to lift up this report and put it into action. And so what do we do about that? Um, so we looked across our region and examined the um, missions and values and leadership of many organizations. And we realized that this was such a novel approach, the call for racial equity there wasn't a place that we could put it. And so we had to pivot, swallow our words and do exactly what we said we weren't going to do, which was establish a new organization to move this work forward. And that organization is called Forward Through Ferguson. Remarkable, talented young folks that were on the journey with the commission acting as um, staff support, many of them. And um, they wake up every day thinking about how to advance racial equity. Um, not only how to advance it, but how to track the progress, how to continue to keep communities, organizations, philanthropy, institutions engaged. That was very, very important um, to make sure that we had that in place. So you've got the work um, so that people can get educated. They need the resources. And then you have to build the infrastructure. You have to build the infrastructure because the next part of it is um, a community of advocates that understand the issues and that have some consensus about where we're going as a community. And that's very difficult work, that's difficult to do. So after the commission, after standing up a nonprofit to do this work, I designed and directed Focus Impact Fellows. And the Impact Fellows came from a broad spectrum of um, industry. My youngest being a, an undergrad, um, the fellows graduated on a Tuesday. He went to DC on Thursday to work as a community engagement specialist with Senator McCaskill, did that for a month, I mean, for a year, came back, ran for state rep, 
he's now my state rep, <laughs> youngest state rep ever. So to say that this work, when you stay in it, there is progress. He's now my state rep. Um, he's lovely. Um, and, and I'm thankful for Kevin Winham <laughs> for moving the agenda, right? So we got to build the capacity. Um, and the, the eldest being corporate counsel at a major financial institution, right? Because when you look at the Ferguson Commission report, we focused on three things, justice for all, which is transforming polices, polices, police and police departments um, and policing, um, youth at the center, which is taking care of our children, they're unhealthy. They're not doing as well as previous generations. Economic mobility, which is a part of the work that I co-chaired, which is about advancing generational economic wellness access and um, improvement, and then a body about racial equity. So these are very, very important tools. I just want to offer another tool, and these are in the resources I shared with um, Mary Beth, but for the sake of all, which is now Health Equity Works, which is embodied in Washington University now. So they've lifted that up and done that, established um, a department to, to do that research and work to advocate for, <clears throat> to, for equity, health equity. And um, people are like, yeah, health equity, but now we've got the COVID pandemic and now people understand precisely what we were talking about when we were demanding attention to the health disparities because it's a life or death matter. So if, if you're interested in that, you can go and, and look at that work. So education, building the infrastructure, which includes building advocates, people that can do the work and then staying in your courage. I've heard it mentioned here, but this is difficult work and you have to be courageous. I guarantee you, if you step into the center of your courage and say something, when you see or hear something, you release the power of individuals around you who are not ready in that moment to do the same. You will be an example for them and you have to be patient. So I've been doing this consistently <laughs> since 20, 2014. And what I've realized is there's a revelation of racism that takes time. And we have to be patient with ourselves and with our family and with our community and enter into this learning, this um, action and activity with grace and forgiveness, which isn't always easy to do, <laughs> but it is necessary. It is absolutely necessary because it takes time to understand. And then you're gonna have some resistance. You're gonna have individual resistance about this new knowledge that you're acquiring. There will be institutional resistance about what the community um, is saying. And after the resistance, you need time to sit and reflect on what you're learning because it will undo for you these truths that you hold. <laughs> that, um, they're not truths. So many of them are, are uh, simply false or misleading and it takes time to unpack those things because you'll be challenged by um, your education and institutions that, that you trust. Um, just know that that's going to happen. That that's that's going to happen. I tell the story of a young woman that I met. She's really dynamic, um, young white woman, um, and we were actually on a panel together. And she shared with me that she was getting a PhD in literature, and it wasn't until 2017 that she heard of. Um, oh gosh, I've lost it. James Baldwin, you mentioned it. Oh, very best. Thank you. Yeah. You were there in the audience. Thanks. This is why you need friends. Um, and she just heard of James Baldwin. And, and so I was thinking about uh, the challenge that will come to the institutions that you trust in the journey that you've been on. Because what that means is that you have to actually question what you know, where that information came from, and how prepared you are, especially as this community becomes more interdependent. So that's very important. It will reveal a lot to you. And if you stay patient, but stay consistent, you, you can con continue in, in this work. Um, so 
What is really important now, and I'm so excited about all of the calls to transform police departments. We called for it in the Ferguson Commission report, but one of the important outcomes of the uprising in Ferguson was the Department of Justice consent decree. The consent decree is a partnership between um, the DOJ and the community to work together to transform police departments. Well, we were really excited under AG Holder. And then we got Jeff Sessions. And the first thing he said is we're not doing the consent decree thing. We're no longer in the civil rights business. And that was a call to governments and police departments that there would be no federal oversight, that that really was not important, um, that the police could police themselves and that the number one um, law enforcement agency in the country was not interested in what was bubbling up from the ground in terms of our calls to end the, the pain and brutality and abuse of um, black and brown people and communities. Um, and here we are, here we are. This is what happens when leaders abdicate their responsibilities. But we're grateful to our team um, from DOJ because they didn't go anywhere and we have been working diligently. So, so what comes out of that? More infrastructure building, right? More infrastructure building. I wanna lift up my family at the Ferguson Collaborative, um, all activists from the street that came to the table to work on this consent decree implementation. So what does that mean? Neighborhood Policing Steering Committee actually participating in rewriting the policies and structuring and designing the training for police officers, having an active role in defining what community, um, what policing looks like, what our preferences are. And it's difficult work, but building the partnerships that are required to get that done. Um, establishing the Human Rights Commission, which was required, but there wasn't one. Mm -hmm. Establishing a citizen review board. Um, we didn't get subpoena power. We're not gonna stop pushing that for it, but <laughs> establishing a civilian review board and continuing to build community capacity. The more people that are in the work, the better we are able to sustain our engagement. And that is what is important is that we all are called as citizens of these United States. There are both duties, rights, but responsibilities to citizenship. And when you're not engaged, we get the mess that we're in now where you've got a majority of the country waking up and going, what the heck is going on? What has happened? I don't even know where, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. And you know, black folks were saying, Really? Did you think Ferguson was a moment? Mm -hmm. It was not. It was not. This is what we sing about, write about, um, you, you know, <laughs> there's theater about it and dances and poetry and books and bodies of research. But I'm happy that we're at this point. I'm happy that we're at this point because what it does is encourage me. One, all of the remarkable young people, all of the remarkable young people um, that are organizing actions, they have the language and they have the commitment to a more just society. So that is very, very encouraging to see this work in places where it was literally forbidden <laughs> just a few um, years ago. Well, a couple weeks ago, actually, to see the work um, the work there. So I, I think that all of those things are, um, are really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, you, I, I'm gonna have to bring us in a little bit, I think, just cause we're a little bit over time. Oh, sorry. But I, no, 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 it's not your fault. We were already behind. Um, but I, I just, I love the way that you're talking about that the sustainability is related to, um, it, 
the maximum number of participants in in the in the movement too right mm -hmm. like if only a small number of people and i think you're one of those people that has borne a disproportionately large burden of the work because you've been an activist in your community in this way but it, i think sustainability is directly related to the maximum number of people being engaged in all the little ways that they can be which is exactly why we're here today trying to have everybody pick up their little piece of this movement right yeah um and so um, I, I'm going to have to kind of bring us home, I think, here because we're running over time. But I just every time I hear folks like Felicia and Lisa talk about their long journey and the way that every single part of getting the work done is is complex and matters a lot and requires a lot of different types of professional expertise um, and community engagement. It just makes me more motivated than ever to bring people back to the table about where they can get involved. And, and I think it's Ferguson is such a compelling example because you've already been through all of those stages of policymaking and nurturing the next generation of leadership. Um, and it is extremely important. And I think a lot of our audience here today can be a part of this that white folks step in and take on this burden. Um, it is our responsibility. It is our duty. Um, we have benefited from the systems that have um, been oppressive to black and brown people. Absolutely. And it's our turn and it's way overdue for us to pick up this work. And so with that, I'm going to have Annette also jump back in here with me yeah. about um, what some next steps can be. We were hoping that we could have some folks um, make some notes in the chat about how we could stay connected or what out of these sessions inspires you? What would you like to see us keep doing? Do you want us to bring some of these speakers back? Um, the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies and the Mortgage Center and Equity by Design are all interested, I think, in keeping this going. Um, and Annette, I'd love it if you could just remind people of the action plan and how that might relate to sustainable engagement. Um, and Felicia, I'm sorry that I had to jump in on you there. Um, I just want to make sure people can move on um, as they need to today. We really appreciate your insights. Um, Annette, could you um, maybe yeah. do, our, do our outro here and, and close yes. us out? Okay. Yes, let, us, let me close this out. So whether you're on Facebook or whether you're on Zoom, if you can put in the um, chat feature, um, let us know what you'd like to see happen moving forward. We specifically had a suggestion that we would actually um, host uh, sessions on each theme and spend time digging into and stretching out that theme and try to bring back the people who participated in e each theme and also bring in new voices as well because um, there were many who just couldn't participate. Uh, we were trying to be in the moment and try to really step in and lean in to an opportunity to really um, bring people to the center and, and start talking um, and dialoguing so that we can get action. So let us know in the chat feature what you'd like to see specifically happen moving forward and specifically in terms of what you thought about how we presented um, the information. We used those themes, we brought speakers in, what else? Um, also just wanna remind you that the work doesn't happen and the work doesn't change unless you make action. So what are you committing to? And there is a worksheet that helps you map out what your action can be, whether it, today, what are you gonna do? This week, this month, the next couple of months, next year, make those connections, make that commitment to yourself. There is something delicious about our brain and our heart. When we write, it affirms the intention to do. And so we created that worksheet so that we can not just talk about this, not just share space, but like we can make action. Felicia's tired, Lisa's tired. They need more people in this movement. Black and brown people are tired. We all need to be a cross-cultural community working actively to make change. Use that worksheet, be intentional, think about what you can do in your private space, in your workspace. Um, and be willing to change. It's gonna hurt. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it's gonna hurt. But what comes from it is more beautiful than you can even imagine. As someone who's mixed race, I have moved, had the blessing of being able in my early life to move around to different countries. And it is beautiful when you braid together the beauty of who we are as a people. When you think about the human condition, it's powerful. So what are we going to do to be a part of braiding 
our culture, our community, and making change to make sure that we welcome all who call this space and place their home. And let's get after it. Use that worksheet. Tell us what you want to see happen next. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being a part of this and jumping in and trying to learn more, hear more. And thank you to all our speakers for being willing to jump in and tell us what we need to know. Um, and just, just thank you, Morgridge and Mary Beth and everyone else for just creating this space and this opportunity. Um, I'll give it back over to Mary Beth, and Mary Beth in case there's something final that needs to be said, but thank you. Just one more thought. Thanks to everyone really sincerely for rolling with our relatively experimental process here, but I think it's been a good step, a first step in this process. Our speakers have been incredibly graceful and patient with us. All of you have been to the wisdom here is just unbelievable. We're going to keep it going. I think the best thing to do to stay in touch with us about this is to just keep following the Center for Community and Nonprofit Studies Facebook page. We've gotten a lot of requests for information about our speakers. So with their permission, we're going to be posting that in the coming days and to come. Um, and I also have gotten some feedback already about what individuals and groups are planning to do on their action plans. And so I really want to find a way to have you all report back on that, so probably through a social media mechanism or through our future sessions. So if you're organizing your own action plan or your own group in your community about what you're going to do next, remember to share that with us and we'll try to create a platform where it's easy to do that. Um, we're going to keep collecting feedback from our speakers and all of you and the center and the mortgage center and Annette and equity by design will take it forward. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope you feel as inspired by everybody today as I do. <laughs>